So, what do you know about your ancestors? Are you a descendant of African farmers, Italian gypsies, British royalty, or American Indians? Maybe you're related to me. Whoa, there's a scary thought. As far as I can tell, I'm the offspring of poor German immigrants. Although modern humans have been around for more than 50,000 years, I've had a hard time tracing my family tree back more than a few generations. Some of you may already think of me as a fossil. Regardless of the pedigree, our genetic heritage is an important part of who we are as individuals. The same is true of insects. But in their case, ancestral lines may go back as far as 400 million years. And even before insects, there were primitive arthropods some five to six hundred million years ago that probably resembled segmented worms with a poorly defined head and paired lateral appendages on each body segment. Today, the phylum Arthropoda is the largest and most diverse group of organisms on Earth. Biologists sort these animals into a hierarchy of classes, orders, families, and genera based on similarities and differences in structure and function. Members of a single family, or order or class, are believed to be more closely related to each other than to members of other families, or orders or classes. This hierarchical system of organization is the foundation of biological nomenclature. So regardless of whether you accept or reject the theory of evolution, it's important to learn the pattern of phylogenetic relationships that underlie the classification system and to recognize the assumptions that have been made about how the tree of life branched and grew. In the end, you will have a better appreciation for each group by learning how it has been shaped by the selective pressures of the past and how it differs from its nearest relatives of the present. So here's one guy's interpretation of the arthropods tree of life. Pages 2 and 3 if you printed out your lesson outline. This scheme, published in 1979 by Bruce Boudreau, is not necessarily right or wrong. It's just a working hypothesis. But it will serve as a good starting point for us to learn how and why biologists group arthropods into various classes and orders. We'll focus on the big picture and not worry about details. The tree starts at the bottom left and grows upward. When you get to class Insecta, go to the bottom of the right side where the tree continues branching into the orders of insects. That's the path I'll follow in explaining it to you. Embedded in this phylogenetic scheme are circled numbers 1 through 13 that represent important milestones in the evolutionary history of modern arthropods, including insects. Each number corresponds to a new or improved physical characteristic, perhaps a mutation or a novel adaptation, that proved to have selective value and was passed on to succeeding generations. These milestones are cumulative. In other words, animals above each milestone have all of the characteristics below it. For quick reference, the 13 milestones are listed here and also under Roman numeral 1 on your lesson outline. So what we see in the big picture is that segmented bodies and jointed legs with claws, milestones 1 and 2, are physical characteristics that are not unique to arthropods. You may recognize annelid worms. They include earthworms, leeches, and the marine tube worms called polychaetes. But I'll bet you've never even heard of tongue worms, water bears, or velvet worms. These are phyla, the same taxonomic level as arthropods, but they have few species, limited distributions, and little or no ecological impact. Don't lose any sleep over them. Milestone 3, an exoskeleton, is the major defining characteristic of phylum arthropoda. It's an adaptation that evidently made it possible for this group of animals to invade new habitats and exploit new resources. It also made them more likely to be preserved as fossils because rigid parts of the exoskeleton were slow to decompose after death. Some arthropods were more successful than others. Trilobites were abundant and widespread during the Triassic period, but they all went extinct about 225 million years ago. That leaves only two main arthropod lineages surviving to the present day. 
the subphylum Chelicerata, and the subphylum Mandibulata. The chelicerate arthropods include arachnids and horseshoe crabs. These are mostly assassins and night stalkers. They are named for the distinctive fangs, called chelicerae, that serve as mouth parts for injecting poison into their hapless prey. The mandibulate arthropods include crustacea, myriapods, and insects. This group is named for the mandibles they use as mouth parts when chewing or grinding solid food. That's milestone number four. Mandibulate arthropods are the most diverse and abundant animals on Earth. Members of the class Crustacea are mostly aquatic and breathe with gills. These animals are extremely abundant in the oceans and also common in fresh water, but their gills don't work without moisture, so crustaceans were never very successful at adapting to life on dry land. The rest of the mandibulate arthropods acquired a tracheal system for breathing air. This adaptation, milestone number five, allowed them to survive and reproduce on land. Gradual reductions in the number of trunk segments and walking legs eventually led to milestone number six, the appearance of six-legged animals, hexapods, with three distinct body regions, head, thorax, and abdomen. This group includes the class Insecta and three other closely related life forms, Protura, Diplura, and Calembola. Some entomologists, we call them lumpers, include these as orders within the class Insecta, while others, they're the splitters, insist that each group deserves its own status as a separate class. Frankly, I don't care whether you call them classes or orders. If you catch one, include it in your insect collection. Splitters and lumpers also disagree about how many insect orders there are and what they should be called. This can be confusing for students who may encounter different order names in different textbooks. To help clarify the mess, you can refer to the table found on page 4 of your lesson outline. The center column is the scheme I use in this course, sort of a middle-of-the-road approach. One of the main reasons for excluding Protura, Diplura, and Calembola from the class Insecta is the way their mouth parts are entonathous, that is, enclosed within the head capsule. All other insects have ectonathous mouth parts that stick out from the head capsule. That's milestone number seven. If you're following along on a printed copy of the phylogenetic tree, it's time to turn to page two. This is a continuation of the branch we were following on page one. It begins at the bottom with the two most primitive orders of ectonathous insects, Archaeonatha and Thysanura. We consider these insects highly primitive for two reasons. One, they are apterigote. That means they are completely wingless. And two, they undergo no change or metamorphosis as they grow up. That's known as ametabolous development. The immature stages, called young, are similar in appearance to the adults, just smaller. Major innovations take place at milestones 8 and 9 in the phylogenetic tree. Here, the insects first exhibit gradual changes in body form as they mature. This is known as incomplete metamorphosis, and these changes lead to the presence of functional wings in the adult stage. Wing development is said to be exopterigote, meaning that wing buds form externally and gradually enlarge as the insect matures. The immature stages are called nymphs. They are visibly different in appearance from the adults. This is hemimetabolous development. Ephemeroptera and Odonata are the most primitive orders of hemimetabolous insects. They are also regarded as having a primitive flight mechanism, infraclass Paleoptera, because the wings are always held outward or upward and cannot be folded down flat against the body when at rest. There is good fossil evidence that as many as six or seven orders of Paleopterous insects were abundant during prehistoric times, but only Ephemeroptera and Odonata have survived to modern times. 
All other winged insects are more modern. They have a special hinge mechanism that allows the wings to fold down against the body when not in use. This adaptation, milestone number 10, helps protect the wings from damage. All insects with this new wing belong to the infraclass Neoptera. Judging from the abundance and diversity of Neoptera, wing folding must have given these insects a significant evolutionary advantage. The orders Plecoptera and Embioptera may be offshoots of the early Neopteran lineage. Neopterous insects apparently flourished during the early Carboniferous period. They were the only animals that could fly, and judging from their abundance as fossils, they enjoyed great ecological success. With the evolution of coniferous plants, insects underwent a massive radiation of species that diverged into the three main branches in the insect's family tree, orthopteroids, hemipteroids, and holometabola. The orthopteroid line includes at least nine living insect orders that have remained relatively unspecialized. Latodia, Isoptera, Mantodia, Orthoptera, Phasmatodia, Mantophasmatodia, Dermaptera, Grilloblatodia, and Zoraptera. These are mostly scavengers and herbivores. They have primitive mouth parts with mandibles for chewing or grinding solid food. Milestone 11 is associated with a reduction in the number of abdominal segments and the concentration of neural tissue into a single abdominal ganglion. Both of these represent a departure from the primitive body form of orthopteroids in which each segment of the body was innervated by a separate pair of ganglia. At milestone number 12, the hemipteroid lineage is distinguished by adaptations of the mouth parts for consuming liquid food by rasping and sucking or by piercing and sucking. These insects are grouped into four orders, Hemiptera, Socoptera, Thysanoptera, and Theraptera. The third lineage of Neoptera, the Holometabola, includes all insects that undergo complete metamorphosis, Holometabolous development. This is milestone number 13, the pinnacle of insect evolution. These insects have four stages in the life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Larvae are quite different in appearance from adults. Development of wings and other adult structures is said to be endopterygote, meaning that it occurs internally during the pupal stage. The nine holometabolous orders, Neuroptera, Coleoptera, Strepsiptera, Mecoptera, Diptera, Siphonoptera, Trichoptera, Lepidoptera, and Hymenoptera include about four-fifths of all living insect species. That concludes this lesson on the milestones in insect evolution. Hopefully you'll be um, a little excited to go out and try to catch the different varieties of insects so that you can kind of have an, a, a variety of insects from different evolutionary points in the insect's life. If you have any further questions, please ask your entomology teacher. Have a nice day.